I don't know if I should talk about this, but you know me, I'm going to. How much money do I make? Am I lonely, honestly? So this might really surprise you. It has somehow been a year since my last Q&A and I always like to dive in deep, real and raw and answer those hard hitting questions and things I need to talk about or I've never talked about before and you guys sent in a lot of very good questions to kick this off. Let's just dive in to the nitty gritty and something I've never talked about before is how much do I make? I have been a YouTuber for 13 years, so I thought it was only fair to give the journey of my income to have it make more sense. And also the how I have this income, how I break down and diversify all my revenue streams. This is for those that are just curious or potentially someone who is interested in getting into this world and understanding it better, what goes on behind the scenes financially. The first two years I was a content creator on YouTube, I made zero dollars. That's just because it was such a new space and it was an unknown territory. And to me, YouTube was just a place where, and it still is, where I have a great community of people, where we share like-minded interests and have just a community of support and love. That is really what has been able to carry me through this journey for 13 years or potentially longer because I truly believe you have to really, really love this career in order to have longevity in it. The next two years I was in college and also YouTube offered AdSense for the first time. The AdSense payment is really just those ad breaks that you see and then the amount in which you are paid is based off a CPM. The CPM is gonna be how much money you get paid per every thousand views your video gets. Meaning one video that gets a million views could be paid a lot differently than another video that gets paid a million views. In these two years, my yearly salary from just AdSense was probably between $3,000 to $5,000 post taxes. Obviously still not enough to live off of, so I worked at a sushi place, I worked at a smoothie place, I worked at a frozen yogurt place and a sandwich shop, all while creating content and going to school. This would have been around 2011, 2012. 2013, 14 is when things really started to change. This is when multi-channel networks started to buy out AdSense from YouTube. There were multitudes of different multi-channel networks, a big one being Style Hall, that's the one I was a part of, and eventually interned at, at the beginning of their start. They were able to buy the ad space from YouTube and then switch it and sell it to a brand that was more in tune with that particular creator, offering a higher CPM to said creator, leaving them with more income. It wasn't really until 2015 that there were brand deals, sponsorships per se, and this was like the wild, wild west of the content creation internet. Everything was so new and it was booming. Post taxes for those next three years, I was making probably 35,000 a year. We are now five years into my content creation journey and it's starting to feel a lot like it could potentially be a full-time career. The next two years, I would say 2015, 2016 is really when sponsorships and brands began for content creators which brought my income for those years, probably post taxes around 60,000 a year. And finally, the past four years is, you know, how you see content creators today. There are multiple different ways to generate revenue, which I will get into, which has brought my annual post tax income to anywhere between 80,000 to 120,000 a year. But with that being said, as a content creator, no income is ever guaranteed. There are so many factors, some within your control and some out of your control that can vary your income greatly. So just because that's what I made the past four years, next year I could potentially make 
half that or even less. It really depends on even where things with AI go or if a creator is able to pivot into other revenue streams. Now let's get into all my revenue streams now that have brought me into being able to be a full-time content creator. I have listed this from things that bring me the least amount of income to the most and I think it's going to be very surprising. The least is going to be what I generate from short form content. This is going to be TikTok and Instagram and short. Next we have merchandise which for me is round about the same per year as short form content. The next is going to be affiliate links and I only use two because these two I have full control over. These are going to be Amazon links and links through magic links. So it's not directly affiliate with a company. These are sites where I can generate affiliate links through pretty much anything I buy, anywhere I shop, I am able to link to. And so I'm not pigeon held to one company specifically. Next we have modeling which I actually haven't done I would say in the past three years but that used to be a big chunk of my income modeling for brands specifically hair care brands. I did do one beauty campaign with a major beauty company that I did the whole photo shoot I was paid for and they ended up scrapping my entire shoot going with another model I won't say who it is, but it was a mermaid based collection. I was a little sad I never got to see the billboards in Sephora. But yes, modeling was a good revenue stream for me and I would not consider myself like a classic model by any means. It definitely was because I was a content creator that I was being chosen for these roles. Next we have AdSense and this truly does vary greatly. Sometimes my AdSense is as low as $1,000 a month. I think the highest it's ever been is $10,000 a month and this is post tax. This is for the recent years. Of course, the next one is going to be brand deals, but it's a larger umbrella. I put a UGC, user generated content, did I get that right? Under that umbrella. And also I hope I get these terms right, but there's dark posting and white listing. And that's almost like UGC, but specifically more for Facebook, you see it. I think slightly Instagram and TikTok, but it's mainly a Facebook thing. You see this a lot with celebrities. Uh, one I see a lot is Hillary Duff. You'll see user generated content from Hillary Duff. It'll say, you know, her name on it. It'll link to her Facebook page. But if it's like dark posted or whitelisted, then it won't actually show up on her Facebook fan page. It is just user generated content. And the difference is, I think if it's dark posted versus whitelisted, one will actually say her name and a link directly and one will just live on the brand's page without linking to her directly and so it's more like user generated content which essentially is content that a creator makes that does not you know usually live at all on their channels. It has your face in it or it just has your voice. It really depends. The most shocking is probably going to be how I have made my most income in the recent years and this is going to be royalties and licensing. Because I've been on YouTube for so long I have a huge catalog of old content and there are companies where they just take the backlog of your old content and then either they'll take another social media page with your name on it and they will re-edit down all of your old content into shorter clips. Usually this comes with a big buyout and then they will split revenue across as they grow these channels for you or you license out your old content to be used on other sites for other purposes and it's not necessarily affiliated with you. Royalties for me are my old modeling gigs where I was more of like a spokesperson or the lead of a campaign for a product and those with the big companies pay out crazy well. I have not done a ton of these but I can tell you if a content creator is collaborating with a brand, their face is on it, their name is on it, if they had a good contract and they had a good deal you can get paid out by, you know, not just amount of units sold, but the regions in which they were sold, what platforms the company decided to advertise your 
you know, face with the product on? Was it in media, social media, TV, magazine, print? I've had my face on a product run in a Super Bowl commercial. And so things like this can greatly vary what kind of royalties you're gonna receive on a gig like that. The only thing with this is there are sometimes unfortunate loopholes in contracts and I have done a few deals like this where they pay initially and then they for some reason drop out and don't pay or they pay you six years later. I said this in the beginning but there is no certainty in content creation. You never really know if you know what you made last year is what you're gonna make next year and so you really need to be smart with how you are saving your money paying your taxes appropriately, pivoting as the social media world changes, and diversifying your revenue stream as much as possible because one day something can be paying well and that platform changes completely. There are so many factors to being self-employed, being a content creator that I could just go on and on about. Like for example, depending on what state you live in, I <laughs> these numbers are gonna sound crazy. My taxes are uh, 35%. I don't think that includes a 15% self-employment tax. I don't know if that's just a California number, but I think it's 15.3%. And I know I'm also in the 35% tax bracket. And together that would be 50% of my income goes straight to Uncle Sam. Also, all of my brand deals, all of my contracts, everything is vetted through my management and my manager who I love they get a 20% commission off of those deals. While you might hear influencers getting really big deals, these numbers dwindle down to the influencer greatly. That is definitely something to be prepared for if you're getting into this industry. What, you know, if you live in a different state, it might affect you differently, but you know, if you see these great numbers being named or coming in, if you're working yourself, just be prepared, they dwindle down greatly. I will also say never rely on a check. I always say never count your chickens before they hatch, even if you have done the work. I have worked with a company I've really loved, created a great video, went over really well, and the company went bankrupt the next month, which they don't have to pay out anything owed to anyone. So that was a situation that was very unfortunate. Things like this actually happen here and there, you know, when you have contracts, it, you know, usually holds people accountable, but not always. Never count a paycheck until it is in your bank account. I really hope you appreciate my breakdown of everything and I hope it gives you understanding and insight rather than me just saying, oh, I can make six figures a year, which is something I am super fortunate I am able to do and super honored that you are a part of this and I am forever grateful that I am able to make my own hours, work from home while still being a single mom and being present. I know I am very lucky to be in this situation and every year that I continue to do it, I am shocked and so grateful. So thank you because I, I wouldn't have any of this without your support over so many years. And it has been a journey and I hope it continues. I know I'm in an industry that is forever changing and who knows, maybe next year I'll make $5. Whoa, I chatted so long on that subject that my camera died. So let's hop into question number two, which is any new exciting projects on the horizon? Answer to that is yes. I don't wanna give too much away, but it's a very in the near future. I'm hoping launch time and when I can tell you more about it is end of November which is coming up super super soon but I will say it's the first time I'm creating something that's uh, a product on my own and let's just say I really love comfy clothes you know I'm a comfy queen and if I'm gonna do something in that world, I'm gonna do it right. And so yeah, I'm really excited about it, but I don't wanna jinx it. So November, December, fingers crossed. A lot of questions about my dating life. I have now been a uh, single mom for three years. And granted, I did have like a five, six-ish month bad relationship. Since then, I have been on two dates. One of them being a coffee date yesterday that did just no sparks flying, did not go well. And yeah, I'm not seeing anyone. I am have my dating apps, but like I don't really check them. It kind of just depresses me. The goal would be 
to meet someone in real life. It's just I don't really get out in the real life alone without my daughter that often at all and I, I don't feel comfortable meeting someone with my daughter. Now that my daughter is older, I just cannot even picture or imagine a man in my life that is worthy to be a part of my child's life, you know, because that that's like the, the end goal of dating someone, right? You date them forever, they're in your life, they're your forever person. And so I'll see people on dating apps and I'm like, oh, they're great for me, but it's not just me anymore. Like I said, I just legitimately cannot visualize a person being good enough to be in my daughter's life. I'm ready for the world or some man to prove me wrong. Let me know how you found a partner, especially if you were a single parent and you found someone. I always see those stories pop up in my TikTok of like, but I have like a child, you know, those TikToks and they're like, they show a photo of the guy and he's like, I don't care. And then it's a whole cute montage of them like having this beautiful life together and it's some motivational thing about the right person is coming and I promise it'll happen and I'm just like, I don't, I don't know. Am I lonely? And the answer is yes and no. There are a lot of times, the times especially when my daughter is with her father and you know, I'm in mom mode. So I, I have best friends, but you know, we're, we don't see each other that often. There's a bit of a distance. They have their own lives now. They have their own relationships. And it's not as easy to just hit someone up and hang out last minute, which leaves me to spend a lot of time that I don't have my daughter with just me. And those times are lonely. I will say there is, you know, a nice, break where I can take a long bath or I can go get my nails done but there are you know times at night where I lay down and I'm like mm, kind of lonely but in the same breath having a bed all to yourself having your house exactly how you want it living as an independent mom and giving your child the best life possible and getting to watch them grow and spending time with them and just i i don't know our bond is so special i do feel whole with that but i would be lying to say that there aren't bouts of loneliness. A lot of questions about, do I want more kids? Am I okay with having just one kid? And I've answered this question a lot in other Q and A's. And as time has went on, I feel like my answer has changed. I was gung ho, I feel like a year out postpartum that I definitely wanted to go through pregnancy again. I wanted a sibling. I wanted a full house. I just felt like I had more mom to give. And it's been, you know, three years now, and I love the one-on-one -on -one bond I have with an only child. I am not 100% opposed to it, but it's not on like a wish list of mine anymore. I, I am super, super content to just have my daughter. She is the best human in the world, and she's only, you know, three and a half, but I did ask her, do you want a sibling? She said no, and I was like, do you want a sister? No, brother, no, and I said, okay. And granted, you know, she is three and a half years old, so maybe her idea will change, but I was the same way when I was her age, and I was an only child, and I have a beautiful bond with my mother. I think this is the first time I can say truthfully that I am happy being one and done. I do always joke with my friend who I know couldn't have kids naturally that I would be the surrogate just because I truly loved being pregnant and experienced that and what a beautiful gift that would be to give to a friend I love so much. We've never like, you know, fully talked about it, but I have made that offer and it is a serious offer, I, I, I think. But I also think, you know, that, that I could have some negative aspects that I, you know, fully haven't thought through, but you know, that thought has crossed my head. Next, what is the hardest part about being a single parent or co-parenting? And I, I, you know, this does really just fall under co-parenting, but it is time without your child. Kids grow up so, so fast that any amount of time you are missing something significant. And even 
if you aren't, you can't help but feel like you are. And as much as you can, you know, send photos between the parents and update and FaceTime and phone call, there are just milestones that you as co-parents can't always see together. And that that to me outweighs any any anything else. And I know some people are like, well, wouldn't this be harder? No. It's it's hard to miss those moments for the reason of it just being separate households. Someone asked me my drink of choice. I have very specific drinks of choice. I love a Moscow Mule, but only if it's in like a copper mug. I'll drink it otherwise, but that's how I prefer it with like some ginger candy. So good. But if I am traveling anywhere tropical, even just like an hour down south. If it's by the beach, it's tropical, okay? Or if a bar has one of those slushy machines, a pina colada, a blended pina colada. I go so hard for a blended pina colada. If we're talking about shots, Casamigos Blanco. That's, I'll, I might do Reposado, but yeah, Cas Casamigos, and it's funny. If I do a margarita, I like them well. I don't like putting Casamigos in a mixed drink. I like shooting it. I think it's the best one to, not that I'm doing a ton of shots, but that is always my shot of choice. Switching from alcohol to my fitness journey, I have been in my fitness girl era for like four months, mainly to gain weight and muscle. And so someone asked, like, you know, how often I work out or my workout plan and my diet. Right now, I only work out two days a week. I really wanna get a third day in just for consistency and routine, but it's it's been hard to find a day to fit that in, unfortunately. I know talking about calories is trigger warning, so trigger warning, but I was at 2,500 calories a day, and I just got bumped up to 2,800 calories per day. My goal is 3,000 calories per day, whether I'm working out or not, with I think like 80 to 100 grams of protein, which I am <laughs> struggling to hit. Protein shakes are kind of like my go-to. I just don't love like a lot of protein or cooking protein, but yeah, that's, that's kind of my journey right now. Work out one hour, two days a week, and you know 2800 calories oh yeah okay this question i got a lot it is how do you take your kids offline or why are your kids offline and i did make a full video explaining why i decided you know as a mom influencer to pivot from showing you know aspects of my child's life to not i'll link that video down below but the how i did it is I just did it. I do obviously still take a lot of photos and actually video too of my daughter. It's just not seen publicly anymore. I put it on a separate hard drive because I don't know if it's something she wants to look at one day or potentially do something with. Growing up in the 90s, I think I have like one or two video clips of me and I love watching them. I love that my mom saved them and so I'm kind of doing the same thing for my daughter just not sharing it publicly. And I don't think there's any right or wrong way to showing or not showing your kids however you see fit. I know some people who post photos of their kids and they just cover up their face or they just always post them where their face is hiding or they blur them out completely or they just are never photographed with their kids. It's whatever works for you and feels best to you and you feel is best for your child and your family, do that. Well guys, I feel like we covered a lot. I was gonna, I had so many questions to answer, but I definitely riffed and riffed on some of them. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you have any future questions for a future Q&A, you know I say it all. So leave them in the comments down below. Again, look out for some big news end of November, December. I will definitely keep you in the loop if you are a comfy girl. This is gonna be so exciting. And please like this video if you like it because it helps the YouTube algorithm or something. And I, I, I always forget to say that. Okay, I'll leave you now. Love you so much. Bye.